As a college football fan, do you really care about the length of a college football game? Now, we diehards savor every last play, every last second of what is an incredibly short season, although our wives and partners certainly feel like it lasts forever, or, or so my wife has told me. Uh, but have we ever really complained about how long it takes to complete a game? Uh, yes, we've all been irritated when the game prior runs over its window, causing our favorite team's game to be pushed to ESPN News or, you know, the dreaded ESPN Plus bump. Uh, but at the end of the day, it hasn't been a huge concern. Here's where we get started. Ross Dellinger released a new article over at SI.com titled, College Football Executives Considering Four Changes to Shorten Games. And honestly, I was shocked at the amount of backlash from football fans on social media. Now let's look at what they're attempting to do. Uh, I'm going to read from his article here. All right. High-ranking college football leaders have been reviewing four specific changes to clock rules, two of which are considered non-controversial, one that has garnered wide support, and a fourth that has left some divided. The non-controversial proposals include, one, prohibiting consecutive timeouts, for example, icing kickers, and two, no longer extending a fourth or third quarter, excuse me, a first or third quarter for an untimed down if the quarter ends on a defensive penalty. The down would be clocked starting the next quarter. Now, while those are considered to be incremental changes that will save only a fraction of time, the other two proposals are more significant. In a third proposal that is garnering wide, uh, wide support, the clock will continue to run after an offense gains a first down, except inside of two minutes and a half. In a more controversial fourth proposal, the clock will continue to run after an incomplete pass once the ball is spotted for play. Now, Dellinger tweeted out that the research shows that running the clock after first downs would remove about seven to nine plays per game. Running clock after incompletions would remove like 15 plays. Now, this stuff is still a ways from final approval, right? Officials involved don't expect anything to pass uh, soon, although maybe it should, at least for a few weeks. Warren Sharp tweeted that they should just shorten halftime from 20 minutes to 15 minutes. Now, he's an NFL guy. He doesn't fully understand what that does as far as traditions, marching bands, etc. Or, you know, maybe for the length of the lines for concessions or restrooms in a 100,000-seat stadium that's only got like six concession stands open, right? <laughs> if you've been uh, to an SEC stadium, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, he said that he's not sure that they realize how huge the ramifications would be on those changes. Or, excuse me. He's not sure they realize how huge the ramifications would be of those changes on the entertainment of the sport. He said far fewer comebacks and late game heroics, harder for underdogs to pull off upsets, fan enjoyment at the end of games goes way down, a terrible way to fix a problem. Now again, Warren Sharp spends most of his fall covering the NFL. He's not a college football guy, but his points are valid. I mean, especially as we head into a more professionalized version of an amateur sport. You know, NIL, expanded 12-team playoff, massive media rights deals, and maybe some smaller ones that could cripple a century-old conference, etc. Uh, but I do want to explain something to all of the college football fans that are paying attention right now. This has nothing to do with the length of games on television. The point of shortening games, at least for the suits, is to limit the number of snaps that colleges are expecting non-employed athletes to play in a season. Everyone wants an expanded playoff. More games with more meaning, right? With an expanded playoff, you're now expecting some teams to play up to 17 total games. Now, it's not everybody, but for example, in the 2021 season, Georgia was undefeated and then lost the SEC championship game. In this newly expanded playoff as a non-champion, the Bulldogs would have been forced to play in the first round of the playoff. Remember, only conference champions get the first four buys. So if they had made the national championship game, their team would have played 17 games that season. They averaged 63.9 offensive plays per game, which would have ranked number 13 in the NFL that season, and 67.6 .6 defensive plays per game, which would have been the most allowed that season in the NFL. The Texans were number 32 with 66.7. So not including special teams, that's 131.5 plays per game. The average plays per game, not including special teams in 2022, was around 137. Now, if they implement all of this, it could remove around 20 plays per game on average. That's 10 plays from each offense. 
That's 240 total snaps gone. More than a game and a half. Just look back over time at how offenses have changed, right? 2009 is when Alabama's national championship run began. That season, there were three offenses that averaged over 80 plays per game. Then you had three again in 2010, but then you had seven in 2011. In 2012, there were 17 offenses that averaged 80-plus plays per game, including our first 90-plus team, Marshall. And that led Nick Saban to question, is this what we want football to be? Now, that was in a press conference talking about Hugh Freeze and Ole Miss and their no-huddle offense. He discussed the impacts of that no-huddle offense on player safety. And that's been nearly 11 years ago. And then it just kept going up. In 2013, we reached 20 teams that averaged over 80 plays per game. And then the total declined to 18 in 2014 and 2015. In 2016, it dropped to 14. By 2017, it was down to 6. 2018 was 7. 2019 was 4. 2020 was back up to 8. 2021 back down to 4. And in 2022, we only had 3. But that's only counting teams that hit 80 plays. From 2012 through 2022, we averaged over 85 teams per season that averaged over 70 offensive plays per game. In 2009, there were 50 teams that averaged 70 plays. Now, in the NFL, just for context, there have only been eight teams between 2012 and 2022 to average 70 offensive plays per game. Now, on every play in upper-level football, there is a chance for somebody to get hurt. And don't get me wrong, every player knows going in that any play could be their last to suit up. Injuries happen all the time. But college football has been reckless. And I understand why it started that way. You catch a defense unprepared, you can no huddle, you can take a shot. It was widely viewed as a way for underdogs to catch up with teams that they're not supposed to beat, at at least on paper. Universities and conferences are expecting unpaid athletes to compete so that they can continue to make in, excuse me, rake in millions, and in some cases, billions with a B. That's where all of this got tricky. It wasn't fair to the smaller schools to not allow them to compete with the big boys of the sport. So you had to include them in a playoff. The conferences and uh, even divisions were not set up equally. So that wasn't fair to keep out teams that didn't make their conference title games. Nothing in this sport has ever been enough for the people that want things to be fair. So the solution was to expand the playoff. Now the top six conferences get a seat at the table, even though only one conference, along with you know the biggest football powers in the Big Ten and the ACC, have proven that they could even navigate a 14 playoff. You want potential NFL draft picks to play in bowl games, in playoff games? This is what has to be done. You limit the risk to the bodies, you play the games, but you play less snaps. People are still going to watch these games. But there was always going to have to be changes made if these schools and these media companies expected to be able to squeeze even more juice from the lemon. Hey, if you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course, jump in the comments. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.